Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's good. I'm Brian Gavage. I am the Chief Market Technologist for End User Computing with VMware. When I first took the job and went home and told my wife what I was doing, she asked me a very sensible question. She said, what does that mean? What it means is that I'm responsible for market strategy in our end user computing business unit. That's what I tell my team, it's what I tell the outside world. What I tell myself is that my mission is to help our customers on the journey that they are on in transforming the way that their users work through technology. And we at VMware have been helping our customers on a critical journey with their IT infrastructure now for over a decade. A journey from rigid, high cost, inefficient infrastructure towards a world where we believe IT infrastructure should be more flexible, more efficient, a world in which IT can genuinely be delivered as a service. We have made a lot of progress, but there is still a long way to go. When we talk to our customers across the globe, we still find that on average, they are spending somewhere between 60 and 85% of their IT budget running the IT capabilities they have now. Now that might just sound like a data point. And I admit that averages can be confusing. When I was a boy, I remember that the average family had 2.1 children and half a dog. Okay, that's kind of everybody, but nobody at all. But where it's serious is to remember that the question of our time from an economic point of view seems to be how do we balance efficiency, cost saving, austerity and growth. We deploy technology in the first place to give us new capabilities, to drive innovation. Technology has underpinned productivity growth in our economies for most of the last 50 years. We need to free up the budget that is tied up in maintaining and running our IT today so that we can drive that growth and that innovation within our organisations. We have made a lot of progress. By our own calculators, if we look at the savings that we are able to deliver to our customers through server virtualization alone within their data centres, Last year, we believe that we drove globally around $10 billion worth of cost savings. That's a significant number. However, we believe there is a long way to go. Is there anyone here who would not be interested in multiplying the savings that they've achieved so far by a factor of six or seven? Because that's what we think we can do. We think we have just started. We think there's a lot more to do. We have only virtualized one part of the data center. There is more that can be done. And we can deliver, through doing this, significant cost savings in the running of IT infrastructure. Now, what you do with those cost savings depends on who you are. Maybe they go straight to the bottom line. Maybe you just use that to increase profitability. But maybe, maybe you use it to invest in new applications, new capabilities. Applications are the business processes, the organizational processes that underpin everything we do as business leaders, as users, as citizens, as students. Maybe you can deploy those next generation capabilities that will drive the innovation and growth, and deploy them more rapidly. The capabilities that will make you competitive, that will differentiate you in your marketplace, and will give you the capabilities that give you leadership in the years ahead. It's your choice what you do with them, but you won't have that choice unless we help you free up the 
costs that are currently being consumed. So today I'm going to talk about three areas of strategic focus for VMware and explain to you how we are trying to take you on the next stages of the journey, how we are trying to help you on your journey, because it's your journey that we're trying to support. The first one, as you've already heard, is the software-defined data center. The second area is hybrid cloud. And the third area, last but not least, is mobility or end-user computing. As you already heard, my home area. I will try not to consume the next 90 or maybe minutes or two hours just talking about that, but I could with all the things that we are doing. Let's start with the software-defined data center. If we look at the journey we've been taking you on, just through server virtualization, first of all, we helped you to save money in capital investment, getting a greater return on your investment in server hardware by quite simply allowing one server, one physical server, to be more logical servers. This helped you, as I say, in terms of the investment in infrastructure. But it also, of course, allowed you to take it to the next phase because once you can put bubbles of software in your data center sitting on hardware, you have the possibility of moving those bubbles around dynamically and treating the underlying resources as pools of capability and so getting even more efficient use from them. And so we've seen that our customers, as they've gone through this journey, have begun with the easiest workloads, they've virtualized those. They've taken the production areas of IT and virtualized those first. And they've taken it into the business applications, supporting the line of business across the organization and virtualized those. And lastly, the some have taken the third step towards truly delivering the capabilities in their data center, the workloads in their data center as a service across the organization. The, uh, the savings that can be achieved at different levels are significant. The return on investment is significant. Where does our customer base sit on this timeline today? We see that around 35% of our customers are still in the first phase. They've typically virtualized between 20 and 30% of their servers. Now keep in mind, and you saw the numbers from Renan just a few minutes ago, we have half a million customers. So whatever your level of statistical state, uh, relevance and significance, we're past that line. Around 35% of our customers are there. Around 45% are in the middle level. They virtualize between 50 and 60% of their servers. Finally, we have around 20% who have already moved as far as they can down this line who've moved into IT as a service within their data center in terms of the compute capabilities. And they have typically virtualized around 90% of their server workloads. Now this is a very relevant data point for this audience here today, for all of you. Because you may not know this, but this is one of the most mature marketplaces in the world for server virtualization. And our team here tells me that amongst our enterprise customers here, Typically, you are already around 90% virtualized. You've already moved down this journey. But as I say, there is more to do. Because this is the way we see the challenge today. We've gone from that very costly server deployment that could take up to 10 weeks to deploy. I'm sure many of you will remember this. To a scenario where a virtual server can cost around $300 instead of $10,000, can be deployed in two minutes. Fantastic, what else is there to do? Well, the problem is, once you've deployed that virtual server, it needs all the other stuff to make it work. It needs storage, it needs networking, security, monitoring, firewall, load balancing, all of the other capabilities that go around it. And what we're seeing is we are accelerating our workload deployment into a queue. And instead of it taking two minutes to deploy, we're seeing a delay of five days, in most cases, to get that workload up and running. So what we're helping you do is to hurry up and wait. 
And that really isn't the full journey. You, as a result, are not actually harnessing all of the capability and all of the promise that we should be giving to you. So we want to take that to the next stage. Use the same principles, the same techniques that we've deployed so far with just one resource area in the data center. And abstract and pool and automate those other capabilities so that we can go from the five days and two minutes just back to a measure of minutes. That's what we need to do to live up to our objective. Now, we need to be realistic about the way things have deployed so far. When we talked about the virtualization of workloads, what's happened is that the workload areas within your data center have not all been virtualized into a common pool. In fact, we've virtualized into silos. And it is then the combination of these silos working with all of those other underlying infrastructure services that have maintained this complexity and this de delay in deployment. We believe we can take all of those now and virtualize and resource pool across all of the different silos. Indeed, we have seen some of the separate silos that we've been virtualizing over the last few years coming together of their own accord. And we believe now that we can follow the same process, not only with compute, but with storage and availability resources and networking, and embed those into this process of abstraction. Embed the virtualization of those capabilities. I'm not talking about deploying boxes that call themselves virtualized something. I'm talking about truly virtualizing them and making them part of the platform. So that every element comes with compute, storage, networking, ready virtualized, ready to be exposed as capabilities to the workload sitting above. And of course, we're going to need to then automate the action of all of those resources. That is what gives us the software-defined data center. So this is our definition. This is a strategic push for the organization to take you on the rest of the journey. The journey we've started. But as I say, there is so much more that we have to do. And through this, we believe you're going to be able to deploy virtual data centers. When you need a new set of capabilities, you can deploy that quickly and easily with everything that's required, not just the server element. And what do we think that means? Instead of deploying capabilities and virtual machines that take those five days, in two minutes, we believe we can get it down to three minutes. You need a new set of capabilities. Your business unit needs new capabilities, new applications to spin up a virtual data center. If you have the resource to support it, you can create it, initialize it, deploy it, and get it running very, very quickly. This is the ability to free up the cost. It's the ability to drive that innovation and that growth and that productivity that I mentioned at the beginning. And what is our platform for doing this? But we have those 500,000 customers that you already heard about. Let me give you some more numbers, because it's pretty significant as a starting point that we have for all of you to go on this journey. We believe that we're currently supporting around 36 million virtual machines. Okay, well that's the compute piece. You already told me about that. Well, on average, those virtual machines are connected to around 200 gigabytes of storage. Now, I was trying to do the math on this yesterday. Anybody up to 36 million times 200 gigabytes? And I ran out of terabytes and petabytes, and I thought it was something like ettobytes, but I may be wrong. Anyway, yottabytes, thank you. So, we're into yottabyte territory. And of course, we've also got on average 1.5 network ports connected to each of those virtual machines. It sounds a bit like those 2.1 kids again, doesn't it? So we've got over 50 million network ports. This is a great platform for starting this journey. This is a great platform for taking that next step on top of the journey you've already started. Now the reason we're describing it that way is because we believe there are two routes to this software-defined data center. 
And it seems to be a, a truism of our time with IT is that we're moving from a one-size-fits-all approach to an, a time when everybody can follow their own route. We are not all the same. Our organizations are not all the same. And so we believe that the options you have are an incremental journey where you quite simply go step by step according to your availability of budget, according to your changing requirements, or you can take the fast route and jump over some of those intermediate steps. The incremental journey is a step, is a journey for those who've already taken those first steps in virtualization and perhaps now want to move to the next stage. And we've actually introduced now a product called vSOM, vSphere with operations management. It's virtualization of the server with the next piece wrapped around it. For us, this is the new standard element in virtualization, the first step on this incremental journey. And to that, we will add the storage and the disaster recovery capability next. Maybe through site recovery management, some of you are already using that, or perhaps even with our vSAN product, which you'll see later this year. Virtual networking and security with our VCNS product. We are putting in place the capabilities to take you on this journey from server virtualization to the virtualization of the entire data center. That's the incremental journey. Now I mentioned vSOL. <coughs> Is that a bird or a bat? It's a virtual bird. It's a virtual bird. Okay. Looks pretty real to me. vSOL is vSphere with operations management. Virtualization by itself, as you know, is a, it's a great packaging technology. It helps rationalize, it helps consolidate, but the real value comes from that next level of management. And so we've wrapped these things together, and we're actually helping our customers take the stage steps on the journey through discounts that will help them tap into the next level of savings. Quite simply, we believe that a customer deploying vSphere by deploying with operations management as well, so vSOM can double the savings they're already achieving. Remember, we're trying to reach six or seven times, not just double, so this is the first step on the journey. Significant business return, just as our customers have already seen a business return from server virtualization. That's the incremental journey. What about the fast journey? Well, the fast journey we already support. A gentleman asked me this morning, when can we do this? Now. The answer is now, but really whether you're ready to make the fast journey or not depends on what kind of legacy you're carrying forward and how much you need to transform your existing infrastructure. That's why we have to support incremental or fast. But if you want to take the fast journey, we released the vCloud suite in the fourth quarter of last year. I hope you all saw that. The vCloud suite drove a hundred million dollars worth of business for us within the first weeks of launch. It didn't drive that business because our customers didn't want it. It drove the business because we delivered to market what the market was looking for. Of course this is far more than just the incremental journey. This is provisioning, this is management of the whole environment, the capability to prepare yourself for cloud-ready data center infrastructure. So, this is the way to take the fast journey. We're offering both options. And we believe with the vCloud suite, from our own ROI calculations again, we are seeing four times ROI, significant savings again. As I pointed out, we've already got customers who've deployed and have bought into this very rapidly. Okay, encouraging results. Show me it's real. I'm going to tell you about Revlon. Hopefully you know Revlon, manufacturer of cosmetics, but actually quite a complex organization. An organization that saw that it was becoming ever more sophisticated with various pieces working together and that sophistication was driving almost exponential increase in the complexity of their organization. They adopted the range of technologies that I've talked about so far. We took them on this journey of virtualizing and automating their infrastructure and they've delivered some significant results. They've saved 
perhaps it's better to say, avoided more than $70 million in cost. That's pretty significant in anybody's business. But perhaps more relevant is they found that they are able now to deal, they have over 530 applications, they're dealing with on average 15,000 moves a month, 15,000 changes across their organization. That's three times as much as they were dealing before. That's three times the ability to adapt and adjust the business processes that undermine everything they do. That makes them faster, it makes them more responsive, it means they're driving their business more rapidly. Very successful deployment for us. So the next stage, the next thing to talk about is the hybrid cloud. Now the hybrid cloud is an interesting challenge. We've talked about the hybrid cloud for a long time, but it often seems as though the market is forcing you to choose between public and private. We believe that's wrong. We don't believe it's public or private. We believe it needs to be public and private. But the problem today is it just doesn't, these two things don't fit together. Business believes the public cloud is already business ready. Right? There is this perception that I can take my credit card, swipe it, access a service, and now I'm up and running. Well, that's great for business. But unfortunately for IT, it doesn't match all their expectations in terms of security and manageability and all of the things that they are measured on. They do not have the confidence or the trust to tap in to those public cloud services. So what are we going to do about this? Well, first of all, the software-defined data center actually gives us a wonderful platform. Quite simply, because we are such a big presence, a leader in the virtualization of infrastructure. We are doing everything we can to make sure that what you have in-house in your private cloud, when you look outside to your service providers, you will find something that looks similar. So that you can extend your own internal capabilities and capacity to somebody else's capacity. That's what the hybrid cloud should be doing allowing you to get access to results without having to own all of the means. So that when you need something extra, you can tap into it temporarily. You can access IT and infrastructure as a service. From the Gartner Data Center Conference last year, we saw that 45% of customers are already looking for this now. They tell us this is a capability they need. They don't want to resource their infrastructure for peak load requirements. But to be able to do that, when you pick up your workloads, your capabilities from inside your existing data center and push them out to a public provider, you need to know that the application will not be changed, that all of the operational parameters around that application will be transferable into that public cloud capability. You need to know that they will deliver the same policy envelope, the same management and security uh, pro profile to you. So in other words, no changes when you move from your assets to somebody else's. So what are we doing here? Well, two things, three things actually. We're doing some things in the area of technology. We've already cut, touched on that. The software defined data center is our initiative for making sure that your data center resources can be quickly replicated in your private cloud. And by continuing to drive adoption of those within public cloud providers, we're doing everything we can to make sure that the technology is ready and that the standardization you're looking for is available in the external market. It really is the best platform for this. And we already have around 220 VSPPs virtual service provider partners globally. Over 10,000 trained individuals out there ready to give you those public cloud services. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough because the market needs to be incented in a way to make sure that the service providers are ready to give you the kind of service you're looking for when you need it. And historically that's not been the way it's looked. 
So what we did earlier this year was we announced at our partner exchange event in February something called cloud credits. Now all the best things are profoundly simple. What we do is we allow our customers to buy through our partners, not from us, through our partners, credits for use with public cloud providers. And those credits mean that they now have the ability, demand, to push out to those public cloud providers for services that look like their own private cloud capabilities. So what we've effectively done is created a demand incentive for the service providers to support your requirement. We've magnified the existing demand requirement by driving an ecosystem demand requirement. And this is a virtuous circle because the partners potentially are selling business for the cloud service providers and the cloud service providers now are delivering additional business through to the partners. So by creating a win-win for the ecosystem, for ourselves, for the ecosystem, we do everything we can to make sure that the market is incented to give you what you've been looking for. But we're doing something else as well. We're actually setting up our own public cloud capability. Not to compete with our virtual service provider partners, but to make sure that we're providing a beacon, a lighthouse, for what the standard should look like. That service will be made available in the middle of this year in North America, and will roll out to Europe, Middle East and Africa towards the end of this year. What does the hybrid cloud promise? Here's an example from Oxford University. Does anybody know here how Oxford University is structured? Okay, I'm a Cambridge guy myself, so I don't like to talk about Oxford so much. Many of you will understand that. But the structure is actually very similar. Oxford University is a federation of colleges. Students belong to colleges, 20 plus colleges, the university owns teaching. Right? It's a federated organisation. What they have done is deployed, with our technology, a shared centralised data centre that's delivering services across all of the teaching community, to the colleges, to the faculties. Okay, a genuine hybrid cloud requirement. But they're actually doing something more with it. Because in the world of academia, research is shared between different institutions. So they developed a data base as a service capability that allows them to protect all of the information they're collecting and researching and deliver it not only as a service inside their own institutions, but to other academic institutions as well. This is IT to support the next generation of workers, a genuine hybrid cloud service. Ah, yes, my favourite topic, mobility and end-user computing. As I like to say, end-user computing is not about technology. It's about how people work through technology. And end-user computing today is far, far, far too complex. Now, if we look at what's happening in this marketplace, and I've been in this industry now, this part of the industry, for 26 years, so I've seen a lot of change. I believe the last five or six years have delivered more change than we'd seen in any period in the previous 20. We've seen an accelerating pattern of adoption for new devices and new capabilities. You know, it's always easy to be wise after the event when the slides have been made. But I thought about adding something else to this that would just reinforce it. How about Facebook? How quickly did that go to 100 million users? The speed at which things are being adopted by the public and then brought into our organisation is accelerating. And you know, above all else, what this means for the people who are delivering end-user cap computing capabilities to their workers and to their users, to whether they're citizens or students or employees, is that they need to be able to deal with change because change is the one constant. Uh, I came from a world of making predictions previously, and I won't be so bold as to make any specific predictions this morning, but I'll make you a general one. There will be 
a next new device at some point in the not too far distant future. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to do the same as we've done so far and scramble to catch up? We can't. The challenge is getting ever bigger. And of course, what we're dealing with as well is not only the devices. In a way, the devices are the least important things. I, I, I often feel that we're moving into an area with the mobile device where devices are a little bit like clothes. You want to be able to change the device according to your requirements, maybe even to what you're wearing. So the mobile device is far more personal for the individual. When it was a beige box sitting under a desk, we didn't care what it looked like. I bet you put a lot more thought into what your phone looks like or your tablet. It's just a personal level of identification. But the other side of this is that we all have multiple digital personas. You don't only do computing at work. You compute in your spare time. And when you go to work, you expect to use the things you're using for your work to do the things that you do in your personal life as well. Look, it might be as mundane as checking your bank balance at lunchtime. Or maybe you're using a break to update your Facebook status. But like it or not, those worlds are coming together. And that's creating a lot of challenge for our customers. With users moving between devices, and users moving their personality on the same device. What it clearly highlights is requirements, both for the users themselves, and also for IT, the people providing the capabilities that the users are taking advantage of. Users need to be able to access the capabilities they, they have and they require for work in a consistent fashion, whatever device they use. Quite simply, the technology that we've used in the past is too invasive. Is it only me? And I accept that I'm kind of getting a bit older now and a bit grumpier by definition, a bit less patient. But is it only me that gets a bit frustrated when those little boxes pop up and say, are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure? Yes, I am. I wouldn't have asked you otherwise. When I log on from a different device, and I'm going to use a different... I don't want to spend 10 minutes getting going. I could have lost the deal by then. I need it to work now. Because that's the speed of the world that I live in. And it's the same for many of you. It's too intrusive. So users need that to be made less transparent, more transparent to them. They also need to be able to separate the personal from the business. This is not only about the business's responsibility. It's about yours as well. If you have personal data, you don't want your personal photo sitting on your device getting erased because the company is doing something to your device. If something happens from a legal context and there's a search and seizure motion, you don't want your personal photo or photo that's disappearing or your videos. Okay, that's your stuff. So it works both ways. And of course you need choice. One of the challenges we see from many organizations now is that they are having to make choices. You're having to make choices too. As I said, the mobile device, the smaller device, is more personal to you. And you may